I was born in Santa Monica, California, but moved to rural southwestern Pennsylvania when I was very young, maybe five or six. There I lived on a beef cattle farm with cows, chickens, horses, an apple orchard in a gigantic vegetable garden. Somewhere in my mid-teens, a divorce landed me in a teeny tiny ex-coal mining town where, well, let's just say I didn't exactly flourish. And right before my senior year of high school, my mom, stepdad, and my three younger siblings moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, which at the time was a small, sleepy beach town in southern North Carolina. I stayed in Pennsylvania with family friends to finish my senior year. After finishing my senior year of high school, and I just barely managed to graduate, probably to the surprise of all of my friends and family, I had to move to Wilmington. But I really didn't want to. All my friends were in Pennsylvania, and my only impression of North Carolina at the time was Mayberry from The Andy Griffith Show. So I came down to the beach under protest, vowing that I'd get a job, save up some money, and move back as soon as I could. But when I got here, something magical happened. The ocean spoke to me in a powerful way. I had been to Virginia Beach for a week on summer vacation a couple of times, but this was different. I somehow felt connected to the ocean. I found both excitement and calm when I was in or near the water. My youngest brother had taken up surfing, and my dad bought me a garage sale surfboard to get me started. And I was hooked. And I mean addicted. I loved surfing, and it became the center of my universe. I obsessed over it. I learned to read the weather, the tides, and the water. Now, make no mistake, I was still a teenage train wreck. I drank heavily and abused pretty much any drug I could get my hands on, and in general lived an unhealthy lifestyle. But when I was in the water, everything was different. I lost myself. My problems and hang-ups fell away. All of my angst and anger and emotional sewage evaporated when I was in the ocean. I fell madly in love with the sea, and I never did go back to Pennsylvania, and I eventually found other ways to stay connected to the ocean. I fished, swam, boated, and dove. It was my passion and my therapy. My obsession, really. And one of my surfing heroes back then was a guy with the unlikely name of Buzzy Kerbox. Buzzy was a pro surfer, and he was always in the top 10 surfers in the world, but I was drawn to him because of the crazy things he and his buddy Laird Hamilton were doing at the time. They were constantly innovating and pushing boundaries. They were the first people I saw windsurfing in gigantic waves. They were towing each other into monstrous waves in a tiny boat. And they were paddling ridiculous distances through very rough seas. They were redefining what's possible. Hello and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach, and my mission is to help get you into the best shape of your life, no matter your age. We have a great show for you today. Buzzy Kerbox is here to share his story of a lifetime spent in the ocean. But before we get to that, I want to let you know that I have a number of free guides over at silveredgefree.com. There you'll find my top tips on nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle that will enable you to enjoy the second half of your life with strength and confidence and show up as the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself, no matter your age. Again, that's silveredgefree.com. So head over there and download whatever you feel would be valuable to you. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on with today's show. Today is Buzzy Kerbox. Buzzy is an author, public speaker, model, iconic waterman, and big wave surfer. 
In today's episode, Buzzy shares how he went from an Indiana boy to one of the best surfers in the world. Along the way, he shares his experiences as a professional surfer and model and how he stays in great surfing shape at age 65. I started our conversation by asking Buzzy how a kid from Indiana got into surfing. I was born and raised for the first 10 years in Indianapolis, Indiana. And my dad was in the Navy and he stopped in Hawaii and I, he came home from work one day and he said, we're moving to Hawaii. <laughs> it's like, right on. hallelujah. Yeah. I, I had been to, we'd go to Florida in the summers and I'd seen a Beach Boys album cover with surfing on it. I thought that looked super cool and that planted a seed. And when he came home and said, we're moving, I, I was delighted. So uh, we got in the... Country Squire station wagon. We drove to San Francisco, loaded on the Lurleen, and sailed into Honolulu Harbor, Aloha Tower, 1967. And I, I took a surf lesson at Waikiki and started surfing every moment I could. And before long, I worked my way into the amateur division from the bottom and started doing better and better. And then in 1974, I won the Smirnoff Amateur contest at sunset and was invited to compete in the pro division and uh later a couple years later the pro tour started and i was on the pro tour for eight years how's that (laughs) yeah eight years on the pro tour so at i guess age 10 or so you literally load up the station wagon drive it to, to the west coast get on a boat and take all your possessions you're there so what was that what was the surf culture like in hawaii in the 60s you know, it was longboarding and there was some event pro events on the North Shore with the with the legendary surfers that had just recently sort of pioneered the big waves, Waimea Bay, Sunset Beach, all the whole North Shore that had happened in the late fifties, early sixties, and almost everybody was still riding longboard. I came along in 67, started on a long board, and then pretty soon they were chopping the board shorter and shorter. The short board revolution came along, and I was right there jumping onto short boards and and, uh, learning how to ride waves with more maneuverability on these short boards and just spawned from there. Yeah, so and I, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm guessing probably a lot of my audience isn't sure why what the difference between a long board and a short board would be. But the shorter the board, the more maneuverable it will be. But the harder it's also going to be to get into some of these big waves, right? So yes. there's a little bit of a trade off yes. as well, a little harder to ride these shorter boards, but certainly more maneuverable. And you know what kids are doing today on these short boards is nothing short of incredible. It's amazing, um, yeah. but certainly back then this that would have been revolutionary, right? You were on the cutting edge of that early short board revolution. So talk to us a little bit. Obviously, you had a knack for for surfing. Were you active in any other sports, or was basically was surfing kind of your life? Well, you know, back in Indiana, I played basketball. I was short. I played baseball. I didn't like it. Uh, in football, the, the on my team, the big the biggest play that I was involved in was fake it to curb box and hand it to anybody else. I just, I wasn't <laughs> like the right size. I was kind of small and uh, I didn't really uh, hit it off well in any, any of the regular ball sports, but surfing, I just took to it. Oh, right on. Okay. And now you had mentioned uh, North shore in there a little bit at some of the surfing competitions and you mentioned, obviously, there's some iconic places there, right? There's Sunset Beach, there's Pipeline, there's Waimea. Talk to us a little bit about what, because I think when people are thinking of surfing, they may think kind of that Beach Boy album cover kind of surfing. But yeah. when you start talking about some of these bigger breaks, what are we talking about? Can you describe what that experience is like surfing some of these bigger breaks? Yeah, you know, I, I guess the best thing I could compare is to be a, a skier. And you start on small mountains and then you start going to bigger and bigger mountains out the back. And sometimes you have to hike way up to get to them and they're steeper and they're heavier. And that's kind of how it is with bigger waves. They're, you're going faster. It's, it's more challenging, it's more risky and uh, more exciting. Okay. And we're going to poke at that a little bit, but let's talk, let's first get some frame of reference for folks listening. When we say that these waves are bigger, what are we talking about? Well, I mean, most competitions are like four to eight foot waves, maybe 10 foot waves. And then 
some of the waves at, at Waimea Bay are 25 foot, what they call 25 foot or 50 foot faces. Back then, they would they would measure the back of the wave, which is half the face value. And now we've kind of gotten back to measuring face value. So, I mean, some of the waves at Waimea were 50 foot tall. Like a, Yeah, so for reference, if you're five foot and change or six foot tall, you can imagine if you're on a, a 50 foot yeah. face, that is a monster of a wave. All right, so... What drew you to surfing bigger and bigger waves? I, I want to talk a good bit about getting into the big wave scene because you, you were a pioneer there. What drew you to that? Because you had mentioned kind of there's more of a thrill involved in these in this pursuit of these bigger waves. And you can find that at certainly, say, Pipeline or Sunset, some of these iconic big waves. But what you're talking about waves on a whole nother scale. What draws you or anybody to that kind of surfing? Well, for me... On the Pro Tour, a lot of the contests, like I said, are not held in really big waves. And some of the best waves here on the North Shore uh, are at Pipeline. And so you get the best day of the year at Pipeline. You get all the best guys in the world. And there's, say, 40, 50, 60 guys there. And only one out of 5, 10, 15 waves is really the good one. So you got everybody just jockeying and and challenging each other to get these waves it's like being at a, back to a ski resort where you're you're at the top of a run and there's 300 people all going down at the same time you know so the the mountain is fun but with all those people it's so distracting and for me it was so you know for a while i i could find my good ways at pipeline but as as it got more and more crowded it was just it, it became very frustrating you get guys go in front of you behind you yelling you know guys ready to kill you for being on their wave i mean it, 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 the intensity of a, a major lineup like particularly like pipeline is it, it's just not that fun it it takes the fun out of it so laird hamilton and i we're doing a lot of windsurfing and we're riding these waves on the outer reefs. And we went, these are great waves out here without all the people. So we started using my Zodiac to tow onto these waves. They were in the beginning a, a little bit bigger, but not way bigger. But they were, we were accessing mountains in the back that nobody was there. And it was incredible. And we were getting great rides. And it, at first guys were like, well, that's cheating. You know, if you didn't paddle on that wave, you shouldn't be on it. What do you guys do? Who do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. And we thought, well, we're getting more waves. We're having more fun. Don't see anything wrong with it. And then as we were doing that, the waves got bigger and bigger. And I, I was never really into giant waves, but hanging out with uh, Laird and another lifeguard, Derek Dorner, they they were both big wave riders. So we started going bigger and bigger. And with the towing technique, we realized that no matter how big it got, we could get out there and get on them and, and get great rides. So that was that's what led me to riding bigger waves and, and towing surfing. Yeah, so I remember in my youth seeing pictures of, you know, this is way before we had any YouTube or anything like that. So you'd have to go to your surf shop and pick up a VHS video. But I can remember pictures, movies of you guys, you and Laird out there on those windsurfers doing absolutely mind-blowing, incredibly things. You're going over these huge waves and these giant airs. And you had mentioned that you started, I think you're credited with, I mean, did you invent tow in surfing? Can we say that? Is that fair? Well, we, I don't know. Has anybody else done I don't it before? Know. You, we I... invented it. A few other guys had done it, you know, as I hear later. One guy that did it was Herbie Fletcher on a jet ski, oh, towed yeah. a few guys in at Second Reef Pipe. But it was kind of a one-off thing where he just threw out a rope and, and towed him on a stand-up ski. Mm -hmm. I personally, I didn't see it or I, I heard that he did it, but that wasn't like, oh, well, let's use that idea. We, I, I had my Zodiac and we were we what I call freeboarding behind it. And in flat water and from the windsurfing thought, well, let's go out to these waves that we're seeing on the outer reef and let's just try to use my boat and, and tow on them. So we we weren't the first guys ever to do it, but they say we pioneered it and, and first guys to really turn it into a way of approaching big waves. Yeah. And so for listeners out there, if you're trying, you're having a hard time following along, picturing what we're talking about. So Buzzy's got this little Zodiac boat and it's probably before jet skis, right? Or I mean, they were a just type they, of a jet ski. They, right? they, the jet ski I had one was a stand up jet ski and they were very yeah. tricky to maneuver, not something I wanted to tow with. 
But at, at that time, the, the sit down wave runners were just coming out. Gotcha. So you have a rope out the back. You're going to tow, say, Laird. <laughs> you take turns. Yeah, take turns. You're going to pull each other. So he, the, the back guy's laying down on surf, surfboard. He's holding onto a rope. You're going to pull him fast enough that he is going the same speed as the wave. Yep. He's going to catch that wave and going to surf it. Meanwhile, you're going to very quickly and deftly get out of the wave <laughs> said boat so that you're not in the wave, right? Cause that's a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so folks, if you just go to Google and, and, and just Google toe in surfing, you'll see what we're talking about, but this would have been, there's yeah, a great so, documentary right now called the hundred foot wave on, that just came out on HBO. And it, it sort of documents the origins of, of what we were doing and guys where they've taken it a sense. Hundred foot I, yeah. I didn't know that. And I'll make sure I put a, a link to that in the show notes as well, so folks can can reference that there. All right. So obviously, you've got to be pretty fit to do what you're doing. Just to be, well, we'd already mentioned that you went on to be a very accomplished surfer. You won some major national titles. You were in the top ten year after year after year of the all the professional surfers in the world. Did you do anything other than just surf in order to stay this fit? I did some some working out. I would what I call beach workouts and using my own body weight, pull ups, dips, uh, beach runs, some light weights, but not much weights. Mo mostly it was body stuff. Didn't do uh, much breath work, and I, I back then I wasn't aware that there was classes. I don't even know if they were uh, available back then. But for free diving and stuff, there's these classes now that a lot of the guys take that can really help expand your lungs. But we just stopped. We would work out on the beach, run, and do pull-ups and dips and, and just use our body weight. I wanted specific muscles for surfing, but I didn't want to be like a bodybuilder and, and oversized muscle that just gets in the way of, of actual performance, what you need. Yeah, so you had mentioned breath work and expanding your lungs. So folks heard you talking about, you know, 50-foot faces and these giant waves that you guys are now chasing. What happens when you wipe out in a giant wave? Eventually, that's going to happen, right? Eventually, you, you can't play out there without getting hammered sometimes. And, you know, you it, it's like getting thrown in a washing machine and that thing is just going. You're getting churned and spun and, and held down. And uh, typically, though, it's maybe 45 seconds. A minute is a long hold down. But sometimes you get held down, and before you can reach the surface from one wave, the next wave rolls over. You get a two-wave hold down. That can be a minute and a half, two minutes if you if you get caught in that situation. I've never – holding my breath has never been a strong suit, so I was always a little fearful, you know, <laughs> in the bigger stuff. But fortunately, I never got held down longer. You just have to stay calm and, and know that it's going to let up, and when it does, you're going to – make a break and swim to the surface and hopefully get there before the next one. So when we started towing surfing, we weren't using any, any flotation. And, and a few years later, we started using flotation, like a, a Coast Guard approved flotation vest. And then maybe eight years ago now, 10 years ago now, uh, a surfer was held down really long and he thought, well, how about having an inflation suit where I could pull a tab and then inflate and pull it up? So he developed a inflation suit. So guys wear that now. Almost everybody surfing big waves has flotation and most of them have inflation as, as safety that's, that's developed from basically from our toe in and getting into bigger waves. Yeah, that's incredible. So <laughs> if folks just want to pause this podcast right now and hold your breath for a minute, that's tricky. Now, imagine that you're out of breath before you take that one. Hopefully you get a gulp. Sometimes you don't, but hopefully you get a <gasps> before you go under and being physically exhausted and then taking that big breath of air, hopefully, and being held down for that amount of time has got to cause some panic and fear. So you had mentioned that the, one of the keys to being this, these hold down and, and to surviving that is to not succumb to that fear, but rather to stay calm. Talk to us a little bit about that mindset. A, there's got to be the mindset of dealing with your fear being pulled into this big wave. And then of course, when the worst happens, how do you negotiate that? How, how do you just, I mean, it's easy to say, yeah, you need to stay calm or else you're in trouble, but 
how does one manage fear on big waves? Well, it's I, I always uh, I've taught my sons and and what I did. Uh, you work your way up the ladder. You know, you you wipe out in a smaller wave and you get churned and and you realize you have to stay calm even in a smaller wave. And as they get bigger, it becomes more and more important. So I've worked my way up from five foot waves to ten foot waves to fifteen foot waves to twenty foot waves, and you just. You know when the trap hits the fan and you're in a bad spot, you just know that you have to stay calm because panic is going to kill you. And and by staying calm and and letting it do its thing and then knowing when it's almost done and start to swim to the surface, it's just you have to, to learn it through a progression of steps. Yeah, and I suppose that makes sense for somebody to go from, say, just learning to surf or being very competent, maybe in small waves, to be thrown right into big waves. It might be a tough situation for them mentally. But as you, I suppose, as you go up in those steps and those small steps, you learn to manage that. But big wave surfing is not for everyone, right? I, in fact, it's not for most people, I think it'd be fair to say. It's a small group of, of people that do it. But to your point, what happened with toe-in surfing is, I like, typically for guys to paddle into 20, 30-foot waves, it takes a lot of experience to be out there and paddle in. And when guys saw us towing in, they didn't have that experience and thought, well, this is an easy way for me to get on a really big wave. And they get out there and they get into big trouble that they're not used to. And we've had, there's been a lot of close calls some incidences and a lot of near drownings. And these guys bite off more than they can chew because they've, they've climbed the ladder without taken it step at a time. They've just jumped to the top. And that's when you really get into trouble. Yeah, that's a great point. And I can see how the appeal for some young buck with a lot of bravado. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, okay, I, I can't <laughs> paddle into that way, but I could certainly get towed into it. And yeah, yeah, I'll ride and go it. For yeah, it. And they, I, I can they, ride it. They yeah, learn. Maybe you can. Maybe you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Buzzy, let's let's talk a little bit about fueling all this activity. So you're still a young man. You're winning on these surf contests. You're out there. You and your buddies are out there pulling each other into these ridiculously big waves. What are you doing for? I, I know at that age, you probably get away with eating whatever you want. But how were you fueling? What were you eating? to fuel all this activity. It sounds like you were very health conscious. You were taking steps to make yourself a stronger and better surfer with exercise. What about nutrition? So, yeah, I never, I never fanatical about my diet, but just trying to be careful and eat good, eat right, get a lot of sleep. I, I, I get tired early. I like to go to bed early, get up early, spend the day like that. I, th I think that's important. And uh, just trying to be reasonable about what you eat. Okay. So yeah, you, you were obviously very health conscious. I mean, I love that you mentioned even the, the importance of sleep because that's one of the most important things you could do in terms of long-term health and longevity, recovery, et cetera. So now a lot of people, when they think, especially if you think back to some of those old um, 50s and 60s surf movies, that there's a there's a party scene. And certainly there there was and is a a culture of partying associated with surfing. Were you ever a part of that? Seen as, as you know, I, I, I would go out and have a few beers and party, but I was usually the first guy to go home. Yep. <laughs> I okay. was never, I was never the last guy at the party ever in my life. I've all, all my friends tease me. Yeah. When I, I get tired, I'm ready to get out of there. So there was, you know, on this, on the surfing tour, there's definitely a party scene. And in the modeling world, there's definitely a party scene. I would, I would party, have a few beers, be with the gang, and then slip out the back door. <laughs> yeah. All right. Right on. That's, that's my MO as well. Yeah. yeah. I'm usually one of the first guys. I'm, hey, I'm just going to hit the head real quick and yeah. I'm gone. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not, a, I can't party. I'm not going to have a beer. I drink some yeah. beers. I'll, I hang and, and, okay. you know, have fun with the best of them. But I just, you know, I, there's nothing, no reason I have to be the last guy at a party. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you there. Okay. Let's, so let's, let's switch gears since you brought it up. You are a, you're, you're probably best known, at least in my, my circles. You're definitely best known for, for surfing and specifically big wave surfing and pioneering the toe in surfing. But you were also a model. And I've always just assumed that that was just something picked up because, hey, you were a good looking kid with a surfboard. But talk to us about modeling and how that all came about. Well, um, uh... Bruce Weber, a New York fashion photographer, saw a picture of me in a surfing magazine and called me up and said, we'd love for you to come to New York and do a shoot for Vogue magazine. 
And at, at the time I was in Australia in between events and I said, well, I, it sounds good. I, I'm not a model. I, are you sure you got the right guy? But wh what's the dates? I go, oh, I can't make that. I've got a, I got a surf contest. Thanks anyway. And then I went and bombed out in that surf contest. And I went running, find a pay phone and called them back, collected New York from Australia. Big time difference, but somehow he was yep. in his apartment, answered it and said, okay. I go, is it too late? He goes, no, if you jump on a plane, you can still make it. So jumped on a plane, flew to New York and did a shoot for Vogue. Those pictures came out and, you know, nothing changed my life. And then maybe a year later, Bruce was in a meeting with Ralph Lauren doing upcoming catalog shoot. And he said, I worked with this guy, might be good for your brand. They flew me to New York dressed me up, sent me in Ralph's office, and I've been working for him for 40 years. Yeah, right on. So you're still currently modeling, right? I mean, uh, my been, last you've done job, your entire life. They, they've been using images uh, of mine from the set late 70s through now. They still use it in different social media and stuff. My last shoot was about a year and a half ago where I got to go with uh, all of my three sons, and we did a, a campaign. Oh, that's awesome. That's very awesome. So, I mean, this sounds like a very glamorous life because you mentioned that, hey, oh, yeah, this New York fashion photographer just happened <laughs> to find me. And, oh, he introduced me to his buddy Ralph. Ralph and, and <laughs> yeah, we've been hanging out and, you know, we were doing these model shoots. And, oh, yeah, by the way, I was in Australia and I couldn't make it. Oh, but then I, last minute I flew to New York. So talk to us <laughs> a little bit about that lifestyle. I mean, that's that is pretty that's pretty special right you've got to travel all over the world is that right yeah between between surfing world tour and modeling i've i've traveled all over the world many laps from europe to tahiti to yeah pretty much every place on the map i'd want to go so just and still doing that today or are you more a little more settled down, down. i still yeah. you know i'll do a, a surf trip and maybe a snowboard trip but not nearly as much travel as i used to Gotcha. What are some of your favorite places? What and all the places you've been are there? What stands out? I really like South Africa. There was great waves there. The the animals going on safari, seeing the lions, and just all all the different stuff there. Australia's fun. Japan's culturally different. Bali. Yeah, every every place is is got some attraction to it. That's that's really cool and different from what I have here. But all in all, I I just feel like. Hawaii is the best place, and I'm I'm happy here. Yeah. So, would, were you able to? Because I, I know somebody in the back of their mind is thinking, okay, is this is this guy a millionaire? Were you able to support yourself all this travel through modeling and surfing? Well, most of my travels were paid for through. In the early days, I had to self finance myself to get going, and then once I was. Uh, top rated surfer on the tour and then it got easier and then for modeling jobs they would fly me fly me to places so uh, most of my travel hasn't been on on my dime and i'm not a millionaire i mean i've made uh, good money but over the the course of you know many years dabbled here and there and raising i've raised three boys and put them through school and and so it's yeah it's i i I live, you know, modestly, but I've I've had a luxuriant lifestyle. That's that's amazing. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and so, if I'm not mistaken, you also had a number of sponsors, right? And especially when you were on tour and all of that, uh, would that be a fair statement? Yeah. So I get clothes and some money, but not never never a huge amount of money. And in Hawaii, I feel like I've done pretty well for myself. And I go to the mainland, and I feel like a peon. I see all these fancy cars and giant houses everywhere. I go, oh my god, I couldn't even couldn't even stay one night at that hotel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So but I want to I want to move forward here to today. But before we go there, one thing I meant to ask you early on, when we were talking about the surfing stuff is kind of that competitive mindset. So you you were in a very competitive sport where you were at the very top echelon. Talk to us a little bit. We talked about fear and overcoming fear, but talk to us about that competitive mindset. What does it take? Uh, obviously, we might be able to imagine what it takes physically to prepare ourselves for these top elite level athletics that you're doing. But what does it take? from a mindset perspective to compete at that level with all these other guys that are great surfers? Well, I'm glad you asked that. 
I grew up with two older brothers, and I, I think that's what uh, sparked my competitive drive and, you know, trying to keep up with older brothers. And then I would get out there, and I'm surfing against all the best surfers in the world, and I'm just this kid from Indiana that's, you know, Johnny come lately. So I had to look what they were doing and dig down deep and find everything that I could do to make myself be competitive. And one of the things in surfing, especially in the early days, it was how many you had to catch like three or four waves in a very short period. So paddling was a premium. So I started working on my paddling. I became one of the best paddlers in the world by doing paddle racing and paddling to keep in shape and be ready for surfing. So I was up against these guys, and I just and they I, I kept coming close. I'd get to the final, I'd get a fourth, I'd get a fifth. I was doing good. My dad just kept telling me, "You got to win one. You got to win one." So I, the first one I really set my goal on was the World Cup, 1978. It was had the highest prize money in surfing history. It was at a, basically my home break, and I just focused everything. I just dreamed. I just told myself, "I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it." I just, I just drilled that into my head that I want that I wanted that more than anything in the world, and everything fell in place. And with my dad on the beach, I, I won the World Cup. I won eight thousand dollars, and I thought I could buy anything in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and that would have been uh, that sunset, right? That sunset, sunset Beach, beach yeah, yeah right on, yeah. 79, I, I, after, and that was climactic for me to win such a big one. And then 79, the tour was New Jersey and Florida and Japan and all these like not very good waves. And I wasn't that motivated. And so I almost didn't go back on tour, although I, I still, I was 16th in the world. The top 16 were invited and my friend was getting ready for Australia. And I said, I'm not going, you know, give it. I go, come on, you got to go, buddy. You're 16th, you're invited. So I got a new board. I reinvigorated and uh, set it a new goal for, for the surf about, which was the, at that time that now the world's richest contest for the first prize of 20 grand. Wow, and uh, I went down to Australia. I got a, a fifth, a third, and then I, I won the surf about. And that was definitely the the climax of my pro tour days. I, I stayed on tour a few years after that and had second and third and fourth, but that was that was my last win. For me, it was more about, you know, I was never the best guy in the water. Nobody ever expected me to win. I was always the underdog. And, and to, to me, nothing more exciting than being the underdog and coming through and winning in the in the biggest moments there are. So that that was exciting for me to be able to do that, and after that, it it just didn't mean as much. And and I at at those times I was very financially motivated, which after that I wasn't as much. But the financial and just the desire to try to beat these guys just made me dig down and do everything in my power. And sometimes the the cards just fall in place for you. So. You had this kind of <laughs> come from behind. Everybody loves a good underdog story. So you kept at it. You you won a couple of those really, really major World Cup surfing championships. You've obviously gone on and done a lot of other things in the water. So we had mentioned the toe-in surfing. You've, you've chased bigger and bigger waves. Obviously, the, you were one of the pioneers, early pioneers of the windsurfing. People listening may have heard the term waterman, um, and th that certainly applies to you. What is a waterman? What is what is that? What well, is that to, to me, mean? it's to me, it's a guy that has a diverse set of skills out in the water, being able to read the currents and and the waves. Right now, I think that the best waterman in the world is a kid from Maui named Kai Lenny. He's he's a good paddling surfer. He's a good toe surfer. He wing foils. He wind surfs. He kites. He does a diverse range of surf related sports at a very very high level. Like in every sport that he does, he he could go head to head with the best guy at that yeah. particular thing. But there's no freak. there's yeah. nobody <laughs> like him that can do that does yeah. as well as he does in all the in all his, his areas. Yeah, so it's that well-rounded kind of person in the water, right? These people often they're free divers, and you'd mentioned that you were one of the best paddlers, and you had done actual paddling competitions. Yeah. So, what would a paddling competition look like? Is it what it sounds like? Uh, well, it's 
Jerry Lopez, one of the, the best surfers of all time, said, why would you take the worst part of surfing and make it into a sport? <laughs> Paddling yeah. is definitely the hardest thing. So some of the races that I started doing were six and eight miles. And you just lay down and paddle your guts out. And then, and then we started doing some channel races and we did, uh, Molokai 32 miles across the Molokai channel with hellacious currents, not, not wanting to help you arrive at your destination. And these are, these, this isn't flat, placid water either, right? People might be hearing currents and thinking, well, okay, so you'd have to angle your, your board as you're paddling. But these are, I mean, yeah, these are rough that, seas, right? Rough is seas, rough yeah. seas. And then, uh, Laird and I, in 1990, we were going to Europe for some uh, different events, a uh, longboard surfing event. And, and I said, well, let's, let's take our paddle boards and let's go paddle the English Channel. So we went and paddled the English Channel, which is only 20 miles, no big deal, except that the current's five, five and six knots headed the wrong way. And we can paddle about going full blast about five five, maybe six miles an hour. So that was mm. challenging. And two weeks after that, Laird wanted to go paddle from Corsica to Italy in the Mediterranean Sea. So we've done some crazy, crazy uh, paddle adventures in, in addition yeah. to a lot of, I've done a lot of races. Yeah. A lot of paddling races, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so let's, let's bring it to current day. You are, I believe, 65 years old, right? That's correct. You're in great shape. I think you're still active. Talk to us today. What do you do today? What, what's your, you know, you're obviously, I, I'm I, guessing I, you're not competing at the, in, in, you know, the world champions of surfing anymore, but what do you, what are you doing today to stay active? Well, the last thing I did when I, when I turned 60, I set a goal. I wanted to do the solo at 60. So I trained and did the Molokai 32 mile race on a stand up board with a stand up paddle. And I had a couple guys that were pretty tough in my age division, and I took that on. My biggest rival beat me, and I got second to him, but we beat – that was in the 60-year-old division, but we beat all the 50s and all the 40s. Oh, wow. Okay, so a couple, a couple <laughs> was, of impressive old men in there then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I – haven't kept up my paddle racing as much. So right now I'm living on the North Shore of Oahu. I surf whenever it's good. I've been wing foiling and just pretty much like in the old days, I, I work out by surfing and using body weight. I do yoga a couple times a week and I do push-ups, pull-ups, dips. I, I just built a little bar set in my yard where I can do like five different exercises on the on the parallel bars, basically from dips and pull ups and all that. Use my body weight and get in the water and surf. I ride my bicycle every day and just try to stay active. I say, get you know, once you sit on the couch too long, it's hard to get up. You just gotta you gotta keep going, and a body in motion tends to stay in motion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Now, you had mentioned um, wing foil. Can you just back up and talk? What I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of folks out there are, are lost. That's, lost that's with a little that advanced. One, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. That's, but that's becoming a thing now. You see it more and more. So one thing that's come along is the, the use of the hydrofoil. Laird Hamilton back, I don't know, 20 years ago, bought this air chair from Florida. So it was the guy went behind the boat. And he sat in his chair and he lifted up on the foil and he'd go across the wake and, and then do these backflips. So Laird and, and Brett Lickle bought one and they tried it and they called it the scare chair. They said, we, we don't sit there, we stand up. So they ripped the chair off and put bindings and did it originally with snowboard boots. And they could lift up on that foil when they're getting towed and ride across the ocean. And so in 20 years, it's advanced. And now guys are riding foils on windsurfing, kite, kiting, and just paddling into waves and getting up and, and riding on that foil. The latest addition is a wing. So it's, it's basically like a kite that you hold in your hand and that's your propulsion. And you get on the ocean with a little wind and you start going, you lift up on that foil and you go flying across the ocean flat water or into waves and it's it's incredible it's it's like the latest craze in surfing 
and it's spreading across the world to places. You, know, you can do it in a lake where there's some wind. It's just amazing. It's so basically the hydrofoil is like a wing upside down under the water. So you're on top of that wing, and when that wing lifts, it lifts you up. Yeah, folks can imagine if you can picture a surfboard, and as opposed to those, you know, a small fin in the back, it's got this long uh, thirty foil, inch, right? this, thirty yeah. to forty inch uh, a mast with the right with the Goes wing down at in the, the bottom water and has yeah. this little T at the bottom, this little wing. And what happens is, of course, the surfboard's got drag. There's a lot of surface area of a surfboard on the water. And it can, it's only going to go so fast, I suppose, because there's some laws of physics there and friction. But once that board goes fast enough, it rises up out of the water onto that wing. So the only thing that's in the water is actually the wing and that mast and the board itself is up elevated a foot or two out of the water. And Buzzy's got one right there and he's holding it up. And I wish you could see it. We're, unfortunately, we're, we're audio only, but yeah, he's holding one up and that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And so these guys that are now getting on these, they can go much faster, right? So this, the rates of speed that they can go are a lot quicker, but yeah, this is, this is popping up everywhere now. So sometimes it's easier just to show it than try just to, to see it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you could so, obviously you could you can Google that as well and see lots of videos examples because that's yeah. the new like you said it's the newest thing that's it's it the seems newest to me thing that's popping it's, up everywhere it's really taken off yeah all right so you're and I'm assuming that you're still keeping up with your sensible nutrition you're yep. working out you're surfing biking kind of living the living the dream there what is what's next for you what do you have in the next say five years you're at sixty five or it doesn't sound like you're just going to rest on your your laurels here are you going to you're planning on staying active? You know, I just want to stay active. I want to keep surfing. I want to keep uh, wing foiling. My kids come out. My youngest is 19. He wants to surf and foil and do all that stuff. My oldest is 28. He comes over. He's coming over to visit from Maui, too. So I just want to uh, stay in the water and keep enjoying the, the ocean activities that I've done and uh, see how long I can keep doing it. Yeah, and that, that's my next question. How long can you keep doing it? Well, I, some, there's some guys out in the water that are surfing that's, that are 70 and they're still surfing big waves. There's some guys 75 that are still out there somewhat. So I don't know. I think I, I've got a, probably another five, maybe 10 years. Ten, by t the 10 years, I'll be, you know, doing uh, longboard and, and stuff. But I, I think I've got another five years where I can stay active. I just got to keep at it and keep my body in shape. I think, you know, uh, one, one thing is I was out of action for a while and I went, okay, I got to get back in shape. And I try to jump back in too quick and, and hurt myself. And I think that a lot of times guys are out of shape and they're going to, they're going to, uh, you know what, I'm going to lose this belly and they're going to jump in and they try to lose it all at once and they hurt something and then they're out and then it's worse than ever. I think that it's important to set goals and as far as fitness, when you're older, I think you have to be very realistic and, and start in slowly, start riding your bike just a little bit, start, you know, come slow. You try to go too quick and you're going to end up, you know, in hurt vils, hurting some Achilles, some something. And I think if you start slow and build and set a goal that uh, you can stay active. So, I mean, that was one of my motivations for doing solo at 60 was to, to let guys know, get off the couch, stay in the game. Keep doing stuff. You can do it. If I can paddle a 32-mile channel at 60 years old, then you can certainly get up and, and do stuff. And guys have told me, yeah, I was paddling just across this thing. And I thought about you crossing that channel. I thought, well, God, I, if you could do that, I can do this. And I, I think once you do big things, little things seem a lot more doable and easy. You know, it's like, oh, gosh, I have to paddle all the way over there or you know, ride my bike five miles. Oh my God. But if, if you ride 20 and then you go, I'm just going to ride five, it's, it seems minor. So start back in slow, set some goals, take it easy and get back in the game because being in the game is, is what makes me happy in my life. I don't want to be on the couch. Yeah, I, that's beautifully said. I, I love the fact that you talk about going that slow and steady is really the way, especially for deconditioned folks and yep. de especially deconditioned older people, yep. that slow and steady is our prescription, right? We don't yep. want to jump right into things. That's a recipe for disaster. And I think a lot of people, they just, they miss the value of those small steps. A lot of small 
actions done consistently can add up to huge results, right? To your point, if you're you're taking just these small steps, you're riding your bike a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then sooner or later, you're doing a 20-mile ride where yeah. now a five-mile ride seems really easy to you, whereas before that seemed insurmountable. So yep. fantastic advice there. And you, I love that your finishing thought there was something along the lines of, I would, I I want to live a full, rich life. I want to do the things that I'm passionate about. I want to be vital and and active as opposed to the opposite. And especially, you know, in your 60s, your 65, that's not the common narrative. If we ask our audience just to close your, close your eyes and imagine a 65-year-old man, they're not imagining you. They're not imagining a guy getting out <laughs> the big waves, doing these, these incredible things, right? But – that should be the narrative that, and we, yeah. you know, through this podcast and folks like you that are kind of shining a light on, Hey, this is what aging can look like. And it's what aging should look like. Right. Yeah. Hats off to you. I, you know, I, I, one last thing is I, I had a friend that was a bodybuilder and he goes, I love going to the gym and he built this giant muscle body. He goes, I just, I, I just, I have to go to the gym three days a week and I just love it. And I, he's got, and he can barely move to tie his shoe. I go, for me, I just I try to build a body, a sport body with the muscles specific for what I I don't want these showboat giant muscles that look good that don't that that are tough to handle. I've been teaching surfing. I got these guys, big muscle guys, and they paddle out once and they're exhausted. It's like yeah, just build the muscles that you need for the activities you want. You don't you don't need to be a bodybuilder, but just you know, just if you were going to be a bike rider, build some leg muscle and. You, you don't need to be, it's not all about looks. It's about what function for me. Yeah. It's that performance versus aesthetics. And a lot yeah. of people, you know, hats off to bodybuilders, right? They do what they do. And that's a whole different ball of wax, right? That's a whole different sport. But to your point, if just to be a, a healthy, active 60 something or 70 something, you, really what you want to do is have that functional strength, that athleticism and yeah. not necessarily be muscle bound, et cetera. So Buzzy, you've got a book. I do. I I just, you on Instagram, and lo and behold, a little while ago, I see <laughs> making waves. That's making right, waves, making yeah. waves. So, so well, I was, was, while I was in, uh, in college, my teacher said keep a journal. So I I kept a journal for the class, and then I just kept on keeping it. And as I traveled around the world, I just kept notes and scraps and took pictures. And I thought someday I'll write a book, and so I did. There you go. It's, it's someday. Yeah. Someday I, I wrote it and uh, self-published and I, you can buy it on my website, buzzykerbox.com. I sign it and send it out. It's a project from my heart, a very personal story of my life as it weaves through the evolution of surfing and, and the sports that evolved you know, during my, my lifetime. And there you have it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fantastic. So Folks, I'll drop that link into the show notes as well. So I would encourage you to go out, do a little bit of exploration. If you've never heard of Buzzy Kerbox, if you're not familiar with big wave surfing, toe-in surfing, some of this foil surfing, etc., certainly look into that. Take a look at the website. Would encourage you to grab that book. That's that's fantastic stuff. So Buzzy, and, what are how can people can, connect with you? You can follow me on Instagram, Buzzy Kerbox on Instagram. And uh, the latest thing, I, I, I did a book tour a couple months ago, so I kept people updated of my book tour activities as I went across California. And the latest project, my middle son decided he wanted to remake some of my modeling shots from like 40 years ago. So we took the shots and we went out, went to the beach and tried to, to redo them. So we've been posting those on Instagram and people are getting a I kick out of that. No, I got, yeah, that's great. So you've got, you've got you at, I don't know, 20. And then here you are Six, many yeah. years later with that, uh, recreating them very, very it's, well. Yeah. It's, no, it's, that's fun. it's been that's fun. Fantastic. Yeah. Some people, some of the comments are like, not everybody would try to recreate shots. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, yep. I don't care. It's just fun. And, you know, I want to see maybe other people recreate other shots too. I was doing that while I was on my book tour and it, it's, it's been fun. So. No, that's, that's cool. Well, you know, I meant to ask you this earlier too. Where does the name Buzzy come from? Well, my whole life, my real name's Burton and I've been called Buzzy from, from birth. And my wife, Barbara asked my mom maybe five years ago, which, I mean, we'd asked her before, but we never got a straight answer. And she finally, after a couple cocktails, she said, well, I had a crush on a boy, Buzzy, at school. 
and I named you Buzzy. My dad never knew. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. But you've been Buzzy from the get-go then. Yeah, yeah always right. been Buzzy. Great. All right. Well, Buzzy, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show, share your story and your experiences with us. You are a fantastic ambassador for healthy aging and really uh, just wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. All right on. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be on the show. I hope I can inspire at least one person to get out there and stay active. Okay, folks, that's our show for this week. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. You can find all the links to the resources we discussed in this episode over at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 91. And you can continue the conversation over there as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on today's show. As we wrap up our time together today, you can show your support for this show in two important ways. One is to tell a friend about this podcast and encourage them to give it a listen. The second is to give this podcast a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on, and be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss any future episodes. And don't forget to visit silveredgefree.com for more great resources. I really appreciate you spending your time with me today, and until next time, stay strong. Stay strong.